Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Litigating a Failure to Warn Claim in Product Liability and Personal Injury Cases. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law sans the expert's consent, i.e., a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. Gerald Goldhaber will discuss legal versus practical definition of a warning, when a warning is needed, legal requirements of a warning, process of creating and evaluating a warning, samples of effective warnings and wacky warnings, and different perspectives on litigating a failure to warn claim. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. Gerald M. Goldhaber has been the nation's leading safety warnings and communications expert for over 39 years. Dr. Goldhaber has been the subject of dozens of interviews by leading networks, newspapers, and magazines, and has designed warnings for dozens of consumer and industrial products. He is also the instructor of the official digital course of warnings and safety communications for the National Association of Continuing Legal Education. Dr. Goldhaber has testified and consulted for lawyers representing corporations or injured parties in over 1,000 lawsuits since 1978 and is currently CNN's chief analyst for issues dealing with warnings or safety communications. His 11th book to be published later this year is titled Murder Incorporated, How Unregulated Industry Kills or Injures Thousands of Americans Every Year and What You Can Do About It. Attendees to require a passcode, the word for today is CLAIM. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLV reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Gerald, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, say a particular welcome to my clients and potential clients, uh, attorneys on defense side or the plaintiff side. Uh, I approach the field of warnings with a total objectivity, relying on my 40 years experience as a scientist and uh, relying on the research I and others in my field have conducted. Uh, today I'd like to go over, as you just heard, several aspects uh, dealing with the failure to warn claim <clears throat> in personal injury or products liability litigation. Well, let's begin with what is exactly a warning. Now, I'm putting together the, this presentation. I thought I'd say there's a legal definition, which many of your attorneys are aware of, and the, uh, a message that alerts product users of a pending danger that's associated with the product or its use. It's got to be a, a proven that there is a danger by research uh, that a corporation or that scientists independent of, cl of corporations have conducted and that they are aware of these dangers, whether or not they've occurred in the field uh, with the product being used is irrelevant to me as a warnings expert. In fact, in my new book that you heard referenced, I make the big point that our economy for decades has been based on an inaccurate model as far as safety goes. <clears throat> that model basically starts with market research to determine need for a product and what kind of product should be developed, followed by uh, designing the product by engineers typically, and then immediately going into the marketing and selling of the product, followed by uh, collecting your profits and waiting for your in-house counsel to calculate the lawsuits. In most cases, it's over 90% are settled, most of those with the non-disclosure agreements. Most of us aren't aware of it. I changed that model. After the research and design element, I would put a full stop on any company thinking of marketing a product until a safety expert, whether it's me or somebody else, comes in and locks the engineers and lawyers and possibly some other executives in a room where they can't get out until I'm satisfied as the expert that they've told me about every potential safety hazard. They'll start out telling me it's a Swiss cheese and sliced bread and nothing can go wrong. 
But by the end of the day, I'll know what the hazards are and the potentiality of them occurring, which we call risk, the likelihood of its occurrence. Then we go on and market and sell the product, knowing that we've put warnings on the product ahead of time. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you the benefits for those of you who are representing corporations today. So a practical definition of a warning, this is what I tell my clients who are not lawyers. It's basically any message, any safety message that communicates a danger, some kind of a hazard that may be associated with the product. The consequences that may occur are important because of telling the, uh, the public that this uh, hazard is there it may or may not get their attention. But if you put the consequences down without overselling the consequences, we want to avoid the boy who cried wolf syndrome. We want to be real. We want to base it on what the science has told us. And uh, in, in addition to the consequences from resulting from the danger, we need to tell the public what they need to do or not do <coughs> to avoid these consequences. That's basically what a warning is needed. I simplify it. There's a danger associated with a product when it's used in its unexpected manner. We call that foreseeability. That's when you need to warn the public, but the product manufacturer knows or should know about the dangers. However, what we find is that the public may not know. So you can simplify this very simply. You call it the danger is not known or obvious to the product's user, and I call it two words, a hidden hazard. <clears throat> if your client uh, has a hidden hazard or if the injured party uh, claims that the hazard was something that they did not know about, and they should have known about it because the manufacturer certainly would have or should have had they listened to the model I introduced at the beginning of this presentation. And uh, the legal requirements then about a warning, and this is if you've decided, okay, Gold is right, we need to have a warning, it's something we know, and it's something that the public uh, does not know, our consumers or our employees are not aware of, then we need to do the right thing. <clears throat> I'll tell you this right now up the top. You need to do the right thing because it's the right thing. I'll also tell you, in my new book, I present a trillion dollars a year is cited by many economists as well as uh, two major law associations as the cost of settling price liability and or personal injury cases. I'm going to repeat that. One trillion dollars a year is out of our economy to settle uh, lawsuits, most of which have non-disclosure agreements. This is a very dangerous precedent. Not only is a trillion dollars, as Everett Dirksen used to say, now we're talking about real money, except he was talking about billions, I'm talking about a trillion. You could think about all the possibilities that we could do as corporations with a trillion dollars divided amongst those who settle the case whether you're expanding your business or going to a new line or doing some advanced research or perhaps paying your employees a lot more money. Uh, a trillion dollars is basically settling lawsuits, and the problem with not telling and why it's dangerous is the government doesn't hear about it and the other consumers don't. I want to give you one quick story. I was involved tangentially in the, in the Stella Liebich lawsuit in 1992 where she was a sweet old lady who spilled hot coffee on her lap and... Uh, Jay Leno and David Letterman, and maybe many of you listening to me now, laughed it off and said, what a silly lawsuit. That's what's wrong with the American legal system. That's not, it wasn't silly, and it wasn't wrong, because everyone said, well, we all know coffee's hot. Well, what you didn't know was that McDonald's, as researched, uh, had told them that the customers were unhappy with the hot coffee. They'd get the drive-in window, and it wasn't hot enough to last till they got to work. So they juiced it up. They used it up to where third-degree burns were likely to happen to anybody whom the coffee spilled on. Well, I learned from Ralph Nader uh, that uh, the uh, Stella Liebig case was not the first Stella Liebig case. There were 400 prior Stella Liebigs, if you get me. And uh, the public never heard about it. Jay Leno and David Letterman went off on her as if she were just landed from Mars and didn't know our coffee was hot. Well, the coffee was so hot that anybody could have been burned in McDonald's and uh, did not warn about it. Even now, the warnings are very weak. So uh, what are the legal requirements of an adequate warning? <clears throat> and I say adequate because if you're contemplating a warning and your attorney, uh, maybe that's some of you, are advising your client, put on just a, some old statement, uh, coffee, hot. 
That's not a warning, friends, and we'll go through why in a second. Uh, Stella Liebig wouldn't have been helped anyway, and her grandson, just to close that story, did not speed through the drive through window and gun it, so therefore her coffee went flying over her lap when she suffered those burns. She actually asked her grandson to pull over to the driveway of the, uh, to the parking lot so she could put the coffee and cream in, uh, the cream and sugar in her coffee, and he was going about two and a half miles an hour. He stopped the car, shut off the engine, and the coffee uh, spilled because she had a shimmer in her arm, and that's what caused it. So those are the facts. You need now to worry about not putting on a simple statement, caution, coffee, hot, if that's the example you want to think about, because that doesn't tell you anything. That tells you absolutely nothing about what the hazard is. And people don't think about it's a hot coffee, that's a hazard, so what do I need to do about it? And uh, the adequate warning, uh, according to the judges and jury, and this is what the fact finder has to determine, but the courts have said the following uh, uh, standards, if you will, and the American National Standards Association, which I'm a member, agrees with the courts. The first thing we have to ask is, are you clearly... Uh, uh, communicating what the danger as it is. And you have to explain it so that the average person at the time of purchase or use will understand the nature and extent of the hazard. You have to understand it. Caution Coffee Hut doesn't tell you it's hazardous. doesn't tell you what the nature and extent of that is. If your coffee is 10 to 20 degrees hotter than the industry average and likely to cause 30 degree burns, that's the nature and extent. And, and words to that effect need to be accompanying the simple statement of what the hazard is. Now, in addition, uh, you have to tell Stella and everybody else, if that's your example, what can happen to her. Now, I wouldn't think if it just said caution coffee hot and I spilled it on my lap that I have to go through a series of skin grafts and suffering enormous pain and uh, go through uh, to ultimately she died, not from that directly, uh, that this would be a terrible consequence. That's what you need to explain very clearly. I've seen dozens and dozens of warnings in my career where the clients tried to get away with it by putting on as little as they can and bury it as far away as they can or distract it as much as they can, and these are my clients no less, and then try to turn to me and say, can you defend this? And most of those phone calls I hang up on. So we need to be very careful that we tell the public not only the details about the hazard, and you don't need to be very wordy. Uh, you're not, you're not, it's not necessary to prepare what I call a Mercedes-Benz warning. In the old days, Mercedes used to run full-page and sometimes two- to three-page spreads to advertise their product, thinking that the thought process was their target market, uh, high-end, uh, very high-end people would uh, take the time and read the book of and the advertisement. That's not what I'm talking about in providing details. You can be very efficient. Uh, wordsmiths like me in the field of communication are very helpful in how to get your message across as clearly and succinctly as you can without overloading the consuming reader uh, of the information. But they must clearly understand uh, the specific harms that can occur to them if they get involved with, say, this hot coffee syndrome. We also need to tell Stella what she needs to do. Now, if I just saw the words coffee hot, I don't think that I'd know what that means. I don't know how hazardous it is, how hot is hot. I don't know what can happen to me if it spills on me. And more importantly, you haven't told me what to do. And uh, I'll leave it to McDonald's to figure that one out. Uh, but I want to make sure they understand and every one of you listening to me understands that you've got to tell the public a solution. You can't just say, watch out, this is very hot coffee. What does that mean? Don't buy the coffee? <clears throat> There are other things they could do. Now, the last thing I'll tell you about the legal requirements are that you have to tell the public where the war I mean, you have to communicate the warning in a way that they can see it or hear it. In the communication field, friends, we have a very simple metric. And in one of my earlier books, uh, I'll brag, I wrote 10 books before this one coming out. The, uh, one of my first books I define the uh, effectiveness of communication, or what I call the metric that tests the efficacy of the communication of any message. It's really quite simple. How do you know your message is effective? Two criteria. Was the message received, heard, seen, read? Was it received 
And if so, was it understood? You can not argue with me about whether the language is understandability, whether it's understandable, if you bury it. And I, believe me, I, I'm not going to name my clients on this, but I had a client, <clears throat> they reluctantly um, asked me to help them put a warning on, and they only did so because uh, a federal court in the Midwest had ordered them to do it or pay a huge fine in the multi-millions of dollar range. That motivated them. Uh, as I'll tell you later, and as I point out clearly in my book, you should be motivated by doing the right thing because it's the right thing, not because you'll save money. You will save money, but don't let that be your determinant and don't let it happen because a judge makes it happen, makes it happen. You have to do it on your own at the stage I mentioned earlier, which is at the point the product's designed, call a halt until you bring in the safety people and brainstorm as long as it takes until you crack that uh, uh, whip long enough that the people will say, all right, this isn't likely to happen, but here's what might happen under these circumstances. Well, let me worry about calculating the risk and determining. There's no uh, Rubicon, if you will, if you're a fan of Caesar. There is no Rubicon, no line in the sand that you're going to have to cross that will tell you where, <clears throat> where you need to put a warning on. You'll know it. You'll know it. Now, you've got to make this warning conspicuous. Many of my clients put the language up there, and then they deliberately hide it or they confound it. One of my clients put it on his product after the judge in the Midwest told him to do it, and they promptly, for about six months, it was great, and then the marketing people couldn't keep out of it, and they kept throwing ads on this product in multiple colors that distracted totally from my warnings. Of course, I had the uh, in my contract the right to veto anything they did. So every time I saw them marketing people's style, I called my client and said, get it out of there, or I can no longer put my stamp of approval on it. So you've got to take this stuff seriously. I do. My reputation's on the line, and I'm not going to put a warning on it and let the client stamp all over it if they put it on for the right reason. So you've got to make it conspicuous. You've got to use the right colors. The print has to be big enough. Borders around capital. There's a whole bunch of bells and whistles that that are involved in uh, whether or not you uh, uh, want that client, uh, want the public to see your warning. Now, <clears throat> there's a whole process involved for creating and evaluating warnings. This isn't just uh, many of my clients. They, they the lawyer called them up and said, "Hey, put on this thing here, and we'll be okay." That is not okay. It's a whole process I go through. First of all, the field of warnings, as you can see in this graph, I hope, as far as whether it's the literature or the mandates from government regulatory or trade associations or even our published literature, this is basically a 20-year phenomenon, 20 to 30 years, uh, that it's evolved where people are starting to get the message that this is something to do. As you can see here, the literature itself came out of the last 20 to 30 years. As you can see here, professional standards were in the last decade to three as well as the federal regulations. So it's a relatively, and I say recent, I mean in terms of a few decades. This isn't something that people have paid attention to, and actually corporations putting product warnings on uh, <clears throat> has really been taken seriously in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, there's a three-phase process that I've developed, and I've taught my colleagues in the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society as their instructor on what the process should be in uh, designing and evaluating a warning. I notice I said evaluating also. First, you need to do a hazard analysis. You'd be shocked to know how many people have thrown warnings on without determining the nature and extent of the hazard. How can you define what the hazard is if you haven't researched it and you haven't talked to the engineering and the marketing, the salespeople, uh, lawyers? We want to know what the potential risk is. Risk means statistically the likelihood of occurrence of the hazards and the consequences. We need to know all these things through our hazard analysis because, remember, a warning has got to contain the hazard, the consequences, what you need to do or not do. So we look at all sorts of data, and that's part of the hazard analysis. We look at claims that have been reported, uh, injuries reported to the government. If you're doing the right thing, you're letting the CPSC or NHTSA or whatever government regulatory agency should know. You're not going to hide it with an NDA. You'll let people know what's happened. That's the only, the right thing. Now, after you do your hazard analysis, you want to know what the competitors are doing. I'm not proud. Jerry Goldhaber was very active in looking at all competitors. One of the first questions I asked my potential clients is, who, uh, who else makes your product? 
I want to know because I want to know what they're, they're talking about. The last thing you want to do, know, do in court is appear and have uh, Jerry Goldberg going to be cross-examined on seven other warnings that the competitors uh, put out that I didn't know about. That's not going to happen uh, to me when I testify. So I want to know what they've done. I also want to know and uh, what the regulatory environment, I have a full-time staff person who just does nothing but look at the regulations, federal, state, and local, uh, the, the agencies involved with the client's products. Because uh, not only we don't trust the clients, but clients are very busy sometimes. They're inundated with document production. And sometimes it slips through the crack. And I have professional relations as a consultant with many of the government agencies anyway. So I'm going to get that stuff one way or the other. But I have to know what the regulatory environment is involved with. Because if the government says do this or do that, sometimes uh, clients mistakenly think they've got to uh, follow uh, every requirement of the government. And they'd be very careful. Example, FDA. I got a client yesterday. He said, this is what the FDA wrote in a man monograph. It turned out the product was an over-the-counter, not a pharmaceutical. And these are only recommendations. And you can go way beyond the FDA's recommendations as long as it's not preemption involved. And to my knowledge, there's very few products, tobacco, for example, where preemption is involved, meaning you can't go above or below what the government mandates. Marketing analysis, <clears throat> any communication, folks, involves who knowing first and foremost who are the receivers of your message. That's where we always begin. We have to know who's the receiver. And then we determine what to say to them and how to say it. Because if you don't know who your audience is in any communication, writing a warning isn't going to be too helpful. If you put it in the wrong channel, in the wrong way, use the wrong words. So we need to rely on, and I ask for that. I want to know if you've got warnings, what are you saying in your marketing materials? Uh, what are you saying in your emails? Uh, engineers are pack rats, remember. They, they used to keep paper. If you, if you, any of you remember the uh, famous uh, Renneker mail that brought down the, uh, uh, the uh, Chrysler rollover, the Jeep rollover litigation, he buried it in a, a memo. I think Iacocca may have buried him in Alaska after that. But the memo itself uh, said that Jeeps roll. Because he's, a, he's an honest engineer, and he, he was in charge of it, and Chrysler was denying they knew about it, and lo and behold, there it was. So that was a problem for the industry. I want to know exactly what the people are saying in-house as well as outside. <clears throat> Finally, in my analysis, which is called information gathering, which is phase one in determining whether to warn and how to warn, is the litigation and claims analysis. I look at all the prior liability litigation they've had. I want to know what the opposite... Uh, warnings experts have said under oath or other experts they've hired in the area of safety and warnings have said. And I want to know what the uh, 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 litigation transcripts look like. It's very helpful to know that. So, at any rate, I've now completed uh, what phase one is. The next phase in designing a warning, remember, this is to determine whether to and how to. So now i got all this information from competitors and the hazard analysis, the regulatory environment, I've looked at their marketing data and their litigation claims. Now it's time for me to sit down. I'm the one who does it. I sit down and I rely on all that information, and I design warnings or I edit existing warnings uh, if the client wants me to review their warnings. And I'm looking at it with the codes and standards, the regs, all the other data from hazard analysis and so on. Then the final step is testing. Most clients don't do that. They don't even think about it. Or if they test it, they, one client who was in the firearms industry actually passed the, the uh, potential warnings around to 10 secretaries and uh, uh, lower administrative assistants and then said, well, they like it. We're going to put it on. Uh, even some warnings people in the early days, they did some research. It's kind of scurrilous in my opinion. They passed around focus groups, uh, warnings, and said, which one do you like? Well, that's not what we are interested in. Remember, communication is only effective if the receiver receives it, not whether they like it, if, if they may love it, but if they never got the message because it was buried in some kind of small, small font, uh, hidden message distracted by loud ads, uh, liking it or not isn't the point. And even if they see it, it's not about liking it. It's about whether it uh, informs you and whether it alters your behavior in some way that makes the uh, use of that product safer for you. So as I design these warnings, I keep all that in mind, and then I go out and test. Remember that if the metric of effectiveness is whether the message is received or understood, that's what Jerry Goldhaber is measuring. 
did the testing audience, the public, did they uh, understand, uh, did they see the warning, and did they understand what they saw? I'll tell you, uh, you want to get inside the weeds a little bit, it's, uh, I've done tests, let's say, for the ATV industry. My client was jointly the government who was pursuing the industry, so I worked for the CPSC, and it was everybody in the industry from Honda and all the other makers of uh, ATVs. This is back in the days in the 80s when the federal consent decree came out banning the three-wheeler, and they wanted to put on warnings on the four-wheeler. <clears throat> well, uh, to determine whether or not the warnings uh, would be seen, we had the clients ship in ATVs, and I had them shipped to a bunch of malls and demographically uh, uh, satisfying areas for me that they were representative, and we even placed some uh, of these in auto shows because we knew that uh, from our own demographic studies that people who like ADVs and use them also happen to like the uh, uh, speed uh, shows. I didn't mean automobile display shows. I'm talking about the speed racing shows. Even Niagara Falls, which was near Buffalo where I was doing a lot of my work, uh, they had a, uh, an, a special event. They closed the streets down, and there was a car race going through there, and we set up tables, and lo and behold, we had a lot of uh, ATV people there. So you want to have people looking at ATVs. Now, I'm not saying to them in the measurement process, hey, did you see my warning over there? That's not the question. <laughs> I think you know that. The question is, did you see any messages on the ATV open-ended? What did you see? And then close in on them and say, well, did you, whatever, whatever they told you, you hold up other stuff and say, did you see this? Did you see that? So you don't prompt them at the beginning. You give them an open-ended, tell us what you just saw. And then we know if they actually saw a warning or not, and we can compare various versions uh, with all the colors and uh, I call the bells and whistles and determine which, which bells we can ring and which whistles we can blow to get a good warning out. After they tell us whether they saw it or not, we hold up signs of what the words were, and we break it down, ask them in their own language, what does this mean to you? And we want to know from coding those open-ended uh, analyses, it's called content analysis, by the way, if you want to know the technical name, and we want to know what they thought it meant. And if a bunch of them, the ANSI standards on this are pretty clear. You've got to have some 90% area and uh, understanding to make it good. In my field, I like 100%, but you're never going to get that. Anyway, there's various ways of doing things. I just described in detail a little bit about how we do mall studies to test whether people see the warnings. Uh, we can also do online surveys. We've done it that way. And there's very good, good and economically effective ways to do online surveys and uh, any other technique. I, one of my divisions is a research firm. Uh, we keep it separate from the warnings people, but the point is uh, there's a lot of tools in our toolbox to test and design warnings. Um, now let's uh, go on. After, uh, that's the third phase. Let me get this thing. Let me show you a few effective warnings. And I'll come back to this one later and some litigation examples. You'll notice here it's a pool warning sign. I designed this, and most of the pool industry has accepted it and used it. And it appears in uh, one of my books. Of, uh, I wrote something of the uh, one of the swimming institutes, uh, spire institutes. Uh, uh, they put this uh, chapter together for me to write. And I talked about pool warnings and why they're effective and put out all my research. Uh, you notice it's got a good signal word, danger. There's a lot of reasons why that's danger because the hazard's immediate. Uh, it's not smoking. Smoking, I wouldn't say danger because it's life-threatening and all that, but it's long-term. Uh, you're not going to take a puff and plutz. So, not a bad phrase, puff and plutz. All right. The shallow water... That's the hazard, isn't it? Two words. Remember I said you could be efficient? Two words, and I just defined the hazard. No diving. Why? Because there's your consequence. You can be paralyzed. I did a study and found that 90% of pool owners and users understood what the word paralyzed meant. People resisted me at the beginning putting that word out there, and I said, well, okay, let's test it. I'm a tester, and I'm in the field of communication and warnings. Let's find out. So we, as Warner Wolf said, we rolled the tape, and we found out that 90% of the public who are familiar with pools, who use them, who dive into pools, understood that you can become paralyzed. So that's a good warning. Now, what's that little squiggly thing to the right? We call it a pictogram or a pictograph. 
And the reason I urge clients to consider pictograms on the uh, warnings that I design is because you'll be shocked by this 40%. That's 4-0, 40%. They may have said no school, no child shall fail. Well, 40% of America does not speak English and does not under and or does not understand English and uh, cannot read or understand the words. They may be able to read them, but they may not understand them. So they're either functionally or totally illiterate. And that number has held steady over the decade. I, I measure that number every five years, and in the last eight times I've done it, it's pretty much flatlined. <clears throat> All right, so there's an example of an effective one. Notice I use red, white, black. Those are ANSI recommended colors for the signal word danger. This is not inside baseball. What we're really trying to do, folks, is standardize uh, our color schemes for the signal word, which is one way to get attention to whether you have a warning, as uh, whether there is a warning there, is to, we want the public to understand when they see danger, which came out of early studies, you know, fire engine red. So people say, oh, wow, that's big. And we uh, put a border around it, and uh, we simplified the language, just two words, hazard, and uh, two words, the instruction, go diving. And why? You can be paralyzed. And we make it big enough, and we put it around the pools. We tell the industry, hey, when the pool installer installs it, put these signs at the point of entry. If you've got fencing laws, then put it up at the entrance gate. If you've got a wall around it, put it on three or four places. Uh, Put it on the liner in three or four places and then have a pictogram so that people who can't read English or don't understand. Or maybe the pool owner neglected the most effective warning, which is to have the person supervising that pool party to actually say to people immediately, no diving, we don't allow diving here, and reinforce it throughout. Many of the pool cases, if not most, are, uh, uh, that end up with injured people, those are uh, become quadriplegias usually, they're diving into three and a half, four feet of water. And those victims are typically uh, teenage boys, typically in the pool for the first time. It's not their pool. And uh, the friend of theirs or some friend, friend invited them to a beer party. That's a sad fact. Here's another one. That was defense. I can defend, let me go back there. I can defend that warning in and out. And I will tell you more in a And when I get after the break, we'll have a couple examples of litigation, and I'll show you how I can defend that. This is a plaintiff's case. Notice it's in Spanish. The reason it's in Spanish is, uh, I'll give a plug to John Padilla down in Houston, a shout-out. He hired me in a lot of these plaintiff's cases, and uh, I didn't have to convince him because he knew the demographics as well as I do, that uh, uh, almost everybody... uh, knows this, that uh, in, particularly in certain regions of Texas, southern Texas and the Valley and other parts of Texas, Spanish is the predominant language spoken. And uh, we have to put anything in Texas and California, some other states, border states, Arizona. I, mean, I insist. Uh, even in New York, I, I've advised strongly my clients to consider Spanish alternative as well as the English on the warning. So you'll notice, again, this is uh, not a warning that the client had up. This is a warning I designed. Now, you're aware, plaintiff's attorneys, that you've got to have alternative design these days if you're going to attack uh, the absence of or the existence of a bad warning. So regularly in my plaintiff's cases, prior to my report and deposition, I will design a warning. This is effective. It's uh, got the uh, right sign, uh, danger, and it's got a signal word. This is from the SAE, the, uh, uh, that uh, exclamation point. And then I'll talk more about the later, but we do provide a very simple instruction that tells them to avoid death or, in- or injury. Here's the things you should or shouldn't do. And I'll give you some details about that one after the break. Another example of an effective warning. Uh, believe it or not, ladders, are, I always used to joke and say ladders are nothing more than uh, a bunch of warning labels looking for a purpose because they're papered with them. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, the industry left out one thing. The most likely hazard to occur is falling off the ladder by jumping it forward. And that, believe it or not, is done all the time. And that is also the warning that is not highlighted. Well, I found an opening. There was a step that had nothing on it. So I put it right on the step where you couldn't get up that ladder without seeing it. And it was the only message there. And I was telling people, this is very dangerous. Don't do it. And uh, the reason I highlighted that one out of the 38 million other warnings on the ladder is because that, according to the uh, researchers in the field of ladder injuries, 
and I got also from the CPSC, the single most likely cause of it is jumping the ladder. But if you don't know what that means, that means you're on the ladder. This is be a three-foot step ladder, and you're too lazy to get down the three feet and move it closer, so you jump it forward. Uh, frustrated ice skaters. Now, another one I did in the ATV industry, I think I mentioned earlier, this was one of the several I had to design. You notice it's got a pictogram sort of, under 12, and uh, this is... Uh, Operation of the ATV by under 12 is pretty bad. Never let kids on it. So, final one is an example. The Ream Water Heater Company. Uh, uh, they hired me to uh, put warnings on because they were getting sued a lot. And they said, well, let's do the right thing. And they did. And we put on warnings that had a lot of pictographic information about what they should or shouldn't do and why it was dangerous and explosions could occur. Again, it's an extensive warning, but that's because there was a lot of information that people... A water heater is a, is a um, passive product. It's not active, meaning you put it in, you may not even see it. You rent a home or you buy a home, and uh, you, you may you totally ignore the warning. So it's got to get your attention. And uh, even though the industry, by the way, has totally changed the nature of the design of the, uh, the heaters so that the pilot light isn't as exposed... Uh, Ream is still doing the right thing, keeping those warning labels up there. Just in the case that something could go wrong, they want to be sure that they've told the people uh, what not to do. And they, the most important instruction is not where to put it, it's what not to put near it. Because uh, uh, the gasoline fumes, people like to store in their garage where a lot of the heaters are, or uh, paint cans and the fumes are heavier than air, they go right down to the floor, and uh, what's waiting for them within a few feet the pilot light, and the rest is kaboom. Now, in my field, I like to say, warn when you have to warn, and by all means, don't warn when you don't have to warn. And I've uh, written position papers for many industries on why they shouldn't warn. I'm not the guy that says warn about everything. Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger, a number of years ago, addressed one of the major law associations and said, if you warn about everything, you warn about nothing. And I happen to agree about that. Let's make warnings there that people will pay attention to because they know if it's a warning, it's serious, as opposed to just some silly thing put on there to avoid a lawsuit, which inevitably will backfire because you put a lousy warning on, get sued anyway. This is one of the silliest warnings I've ever seen. Uh, they're telling a mother that she shouldn't fold this thing, the, the uh, stroller, until she's removed her kid. <laughs> Okay, that won the award, the wackiest warning of the year. I have a great staff. They collect for me silly warnings, and some other people around the country do this. And every year I publish a newsletter with the funniest, silliest, most unnecessary warnings. It's on the Buffalo Bills, my old home team football team. They said, uh, these decals will not protect you. So if you put a decal on your, your arm or your sweatshirt, it's not going to protect you from playing football. So it's like the old Superman uniform that kids would, uh, parents would rent for their kids for Halloween. They actually had a warning. I said, uh, do not attempt to fly while wearing this. I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh on that one. Uh, there's one on the Epson printer ink. It says, don't drink it. I guess that uh, goes with the don't eat the battery on the back of a lot of cell phones. So well, if you're kind of hungry and thirsty, chomp on a battery and drink it down with the, uh, the Epson ink. This one was... Uh, you know, you're on an airplane, you're snacking away, and there's the peanuts with the label on it. Contains peanuts. Okay. It was the same thing. This one's fish, uh, fish pieces, and it says danger. It contains fish. All right. Here's one that uh, this came out last year. Uh, <clears throat> we never thought we'd see it, but there it is. Blade sharp. You know, in law school, attorneys, you know this. In law school, you're taught, as, as, at least at the law schools I've lectured at, <laughs> the tort attorneys always tell me they use an example of an open and obvious hazard not requiring a warning that the, sh the knife is sharp. Well, lo and behold, my great staff, headed by the Paul Liner, he, he found this. The blades are sharp. They finally found a warning where they said that. And this was the last one, uh, silly warnings. You know, this year, New York Philharmonic did a series of concerts linked to Star Wars. We'd watch the movie and, and all that stuff. And the, they were giving away these uh, actual sound light phasers or something and said, don't use it as a battle device in, in actual uh, warfare. Folks, we have good warnings that are needed. We have bad warnings that are stupid or ineffective. 
and uh, we have introduced to you a process by which you should decide whether to design and how to measure a warning, and I've told you what a warning is and what it isn't, and uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you. We are now entering the Q&A session. Please remember, if you're applying for CLE credit, you must attend for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. During this time, please enter the passcode, which is CLAIM. Also, you may enter any questions that you have for Dr. Goldhaber. Our first question is, when is a warning too much to have the desired effect? For example, pharmaceutical advertisements have so many contraindications listed that the listener or viewer's eyes can glaze over. This might chill the likelihood that a customer would purchase the product, and it might ruin the effect of the warning by diluting the message. I'm glad you asked that question, really, because I have a whole chapter in my new book devoted. If I keep telling you about the new book, nobody's going to buy it. Buy it. Murder Incorporated. You'll love it. And uh, I will tell you this. The problem with information overload, whether it's for a warning or anything else, is that when you dilute the message that you're really trying to get across, people are going to turn it off. And that's why I said uh, just a minute ago, Make sure that if we put a warning on a product, make sure we do it as efficiently with as few words as possible without hiding what the real harm is and its consequences. The pharmaceutical industry is probably the most corrupt industry in the United States as far as warnings go. And they do it in full compliance with the FDA. And I say that as a consultant to the FDA. The FDA has turned the other cheek and allowed, and a lot of this has to do with the revolving door, but I'm not going to go into the politics of it, but you, you know what I mean by a revolving door. The people who run these agencies tend to come from the very corporations they're supposed to regulate, and then they go right back to them. So the revolving door hits them in the butt, coming and going. That doesn't give you objectivity. So what I suggest is this. Look at the farmer ads on TV, if you doubt what I said. <clears throat> and I'll define what I mean by corrupt. Communication is not effective if the message is not received. You watch any one of these ads uh, that require you to that end with, ask your doctor, because they don't want to be the ones prescribing it until the doctor. You know, the learned intermediary doctrine is gone the minute you go DTC, direct to consumer, on your advertising. So the industry no longer using shill doctors to speak to doctors, and then leaving the doctor in the hot seat as the learned intermediary who you can sue if something goes wrong with the drug prescription. Now they're on the hot seat. Well, they do. They rattle off warnings as fast and as far as they can, but what's that? all about. In the uh, television industry, and I'm on television with CNN and uh, uh, other, uh, other uh, networks, I can tell you that the, it's a visual, it's an optics medium. That means it's our eyes that are getting the message, not our ears. It's dominant. I come from the background, my business partner years ago until he passed away was Marshall McLuhan. And uh, the uh, medium is the message. In this case, television is an optics, visual-oriented medium. And so when the warnings are, you'll notice this, when the warnings are being presented, you don't see a doctor in a white suit with a stethoscope, a real doctor, not a fake actor doctor, sitting down with the patient in his office, visually, now you're looking at a doctor talking to the patient. Maybe the patient's even in bed uh, at a hospital to convey serious visuals. And he's saying to them, now, look, I don't know if this will work or not, but let's try it, but here's some things you've got to know. And the nurse is saying it, reinforcing Now, that's a visual uh, representation of what the words are. Now, in the case of what you are seeing in these fraudulent ads on television, <clears throat> and the only reason they're there is because they have to go DTC because they can't go through the doctors anymore by using shills, paying them a big fee to recommend drugs to other doctors. So what I see is now a warning where they're telling you everything from you'll cut your nail to black your eye to you'll die from this product, and they list 10 or 15 or 20 things. They're overloading you with the message in that respect. But more importantly, while they're saying that, who you see? Sexy women, handsome men, grandma and grandpa who have suddenly recovered from every disease possible, and they're throwing footballs in the park, and it goes on and on. You watch. The visuals will uh, convey the message, and that message is healthy, happy people, and they begin the thing with, this is the greatest thing since Swiss cheese, and they end it with the greatest thing since Swiss cheese, and that's the message that people walk away, of course, with, you know, ask your doctor if so-and-so is right for you. That's 
an example of overload and using distortion deliberately. And the FDA is in full compliance with this. They have not vetoed one of those visual ads. So uh, beware, public, if you want, and don't rely on the doctor to read and all the warnings that they put out in the PDRs, the physician desk reference. I did a national study on that. <clears throat> it's confidential, but I'll tell you the main headline. Doctors don't read the PDRs. They don't. And so uh, for the pharmaceutical industry to say, hey, the doctor got the warnings, that's as corrupt as putting ads on television that uh, nobody's going to remember the warnings on. And I tested people who heard the warnings on radio versus those who saw them on TV. The results were obvious. People on the radio heard and could recall warnings, not everything, but some of it. People on TV who saw it on TV, almost none. All right, next question. Thank you for your answer. We're going to hold the rest of the questions till the end. You can continue on with your presentation. Okay, uh, let's go on there then. Uh, move that. There we go. Let's talk about uh, how do you use what I said in a plaintiff's case or in a defense case. Uh, in the plaintiff's case, we're going to bring back that uniform propane filling machine. Now, I have on there, uh, this one I don't think shows it, but to the left of that warning is an actual uh, pictogram of a fire hazard uh, using the uh, uh, tested uh, uh, a symbol for fire hazard, which the ANSI publishes in the back of one of their appendices, Z535, which is the ANSI standard, and there's five volumes or six volumes, and they have appendices, one of which has the research protocol that I and other warnings experts follow. This particular case, the uh, uh, plaintiff, and I was working for the plaintiff's case, in this particular case, the plaintiff was an employee at a, um, a uh, place where you fill up your propane tanks. And they have a filling station, you call it a uniform filling station. And fortunately, the uh, people were keeping the uh, machines going, and it's almost like a, an assembly belt, a circle, where a tank moves around and gets to the place where the fuel is filling up the tank, and next one, next one, next one, and so on. Well, they kept it going, slower speed perhaps, but the, uh, the maintenance uh, people decided not to shut it off. I see this a lot in electrical hazards and gas hazards. Cases, people keep it going because they, they, it takes a long time to restart and time is money, so they keep it going, despite the fact that it's very hazardous, as you can see in this case. Uh, right, right next, within a few feet of this uh, uniform filling machine, with their propane tanks and so on, was a water heater. Well, you heard from me in the ream, what the heck is a water heater? It's a pilot light waiting to touch fuel and explode everybody around you and burn them up in flames. That's what happened here. And uh, there were no warnings. There were no warnings. The carousel kept going, and uh, the water heater kept, uh, there was a tank leak, and the water heater ignited the fumes from the tank, and there it was, kaboom and fire. And as Michael Wolf says, fire and fury. So I would like to say that this case could have been resolved very quickly had the manufacturer simply put a warning up and used that warning, as far as the employer goes, to train. As you know, OSHA requires uh, the employer to provide a safe workplace, and if hazards exist, the employer must communicate those hazards in training and so forth. And this was not done, and the warnings weren't there, and the employees were totally uninformed, and common sense wasn't uh, available because they didn't put one and one together. The water heater's pilot light, which is a hidden hazard, unlike Ream, which tells you it's a hidden hazard, nobody here told them anything, and the employer didn't tell the employees, and that's what led to this hazard. This was an easy case as far as the plaintiffs goes. It was not an easy case as far as the injuries that occurred. Now, I want to come back to the pool industry. I've defended the pool industry for 30 years. And the reason I've defended it for 30 years, ah, water's good, is because the industry in the state of Michigan, there have been several rulings, as I recall, where the judges have ruled in uh, Michigan courts that an open and obvious hazard, such as diving into shallow water, is uh, uh, not... Um, is, is evidence that you don't need to warn about this, but I uh, decided after looking at all the quadriplegia cases, I told the industry uh, I'd rather uh, you erred on the uh, safety side because too many kids, and they're mostly kids and mostly young guys, 
trying to influence the girls and doing tricks and diving and so on. And most of the time they drink a lot of beer or smoke some marijuana or they're, they're, they're impeded in some way chemically and they uh, don't eat a lot of food. In fact, in most of these cases, there's potato chips and pretzels, you know, typical teenage junk food. And they, uh, when you add that up, you drink a lot and you don't eat much. And then you add on top of that, in one case, they, they actually had just seen that billion, the billionaire's daredevil NBC movie. And the guy climbed up. He didn't climb up on the roof. He climbed up on a 10-foot fence to dive in. And he's six foot three. He was on the high school basketball team, if I remember, and he dives from the 10-foot fence to get extra height so he can do a flip into a shallow water above-ground pool with three other people standing there, obviously communicating to him uh, that it was waist-high deep. And still, he went ahead and did it, obviously influenced by the alcohol that he had drunk. The case can be defended very simply. Uh, the uh, defendant uh, made a pool liner, and that pool liner, in this case, had the warning on it, and the homeowner wasn't there, so they couldn't provide warnings, and certainly their teenage kids weren't going to. And so, therefore, because it would ruin the vibe of the pool party, along with two cases of beer they brought, two uh, kegs of beer, I'm sorry, brought in. And um, this particular case of interest to me, uh, at the beginning of my career, I found that uh, the, the, the jury was out, I had testified, and they, they, uh, the plaintiff blinked. He took a settlement of about 3 or $4 million, which to those of you who have tried quadriplegia cases, you know that's chump change. It can cost $30, $40 million in, if the case goes to jury, and it costs a, to maintain a quadriplegia is, is millions of dollars. So uh, this uh, settlement occurred, and I asked the lawyer for permission to talk to the jury and the judge, and everybody agreed, and I could, you know, if they wanted to hang around, just had one question, I said, what were you going to decide? And the jury was about to give a unanimous verdict for about $25, $30 billion, which stunned me, absolutely stunned me. We had a drunk plaintiff on top of a 10-foot fence diving into three and a half feet of water in front of three people standing in the pool at waist-high depth. Uh, in broad daylight, and the sun was out, the, the depth of the pool was open and obvious. Uh, you could see it, and I was just stunned by that. I, I said one question, can I ask you why? And everyone said, well, we loved your testimony, and we agreed with your testimony. However, the kids are quadriplegia, and somebody's got to pay. That's when I discovered, thank goodness, early on, that deep pockets product liability is the rule I stick <laughs> and not take it personally that they agreed with what I said but came to an opposite conclusion in the verdict. Uh, I put this one on because I felt it's important for you to know that when you have a warnings expert, you've got to have credentials. And you as a plaintiff's lawyer or a defense lawyer hiring or interviewing somebody, you should ask these questions. What qualification do they have? Now, you know, the Darbier Fry ruling requires the uh, at the state level's Fry, at the federal level Darbier, you've got to have credentials. You can't just simply be an armchair expert. Well, I'm an expert because I've been around this field for 34 years. And the expert's name was Phineas T. B.S. Artist. I don't uh, think that an expert today is going to try to flim flam, but there are weaknesses in most experts' uh, CVs that I typically will point out uh, to my opposites. Not to discredit so much as to ask the questions that they need to answer correctly to a jury during voir dire if they're to be accepted as an expert. And uh, what are your credentials? What have you published? Have you designed any warnings? Uh, uh, what's your, dog? you know, you can do a Google search and find out their dog bear history and fry history, and uh, you should do that. Uh, test the, has, has this person got any grants? Is this person uh, uh, known in the field? Does he belong to the associations that warnings experts typically belong to? Does he uh, deliver presentations to those associations? I mean, you can go on and on, but... Uh, too often, uh, experts aren't interviewed rigorously, and too often experts are hired, and they're really not experts. I've seen so many engineers get up there because they simply say, I'm an industrial engineer, I design products, warnings are part of the design, therefore I'm an expert. No, you're not. <laughs> you're just not. Or someone will get up there and say, I'm a, uh, a psychologist, and I know all about human behavior, therefore I can tell you about a warning. And what is, no, you're not. 
No, you're not at all. You may be able to talk about you. I'm, look, I have, I have a, almost a major as well in industrial psychology, and I would never put my my shingle out saying I'm a warnings expert just because I know things about human factors. Uh, no, I'm not a warnings expert unless <coughs> unless I know about how language needs to be put together. And I'm not, I'm not an English teacher. I was a professor of communication. Uh, English and uh, linguistics may deal with language and their meaning, but they don't deal with the effects of that language. They don't deal with it in the safety context. I've been doing it for 40 years. And I, I ask my uh, clients when they want to prepare cross-examination of the other side's expert, I'll give them 100 questions to ask, and, and I guarantee you that most of those uh, questions won't be the way they should answer them as, as I look at a lot of the experts in the field. And uh, I just think you need to be very cautious in the kinds of experts you put up as a warnings expert. It's a very specialized field. There's probably only about 25, 30 people, maybe even less, that, that are really great at what they do. And uh, it's not just a matter of how they present and what they present uh, and what they know and what their background is. They've also got to be able to talk to the jury. Uh, I, I, I always ask to go last because I watch a lot of the jury, but I'm watching the nonverbal communication of the jury. And half the time when you get your technical experts up there, you know, they're, when you're, they're dozing off, they're, they're bored, they're looking down, watch their eye contact. And you've got to say it in a way that's interesting without cheapening what you have to say. I won't say any more about that, but testing the expert's background and the qualifications is very important. What are we looking at at the end of the day? We're looking at warnings must communicate to the user of the product at the time of purchase or use such that they are telling the, um, the consumer enough information so they have informed choice. That's what this is about. I'm not your warnings nanny. I make that very clear in my new book. I am not going to hover over you and say, warn, warn, warn. In fact, um, I was hired by the CPSC and asked to join one of their roundtables, which I do occasionally, to tell about uh, the inline skating warnings that were needed. Speaker after speaker after speaker addressed the uh, audience and said, we need Smokey the Bear saying don't do it, meaning put on your, uh, your pads and your helmet and all that safety gear is what they're trying to get across. I said, whoa. And then another one said, have mom and dad get up there. They'll listen. Have a teacher get up there. Have a policeman get up there. And I'm listening to all this stuff, and I said, you know, i got to tell you one thing. Um, no, 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 and no. Uh, your audience, remember, communication begins and ends with the receiver. Who's your receiver? Teenage boys. That's who buys these things and uses it, even younger, preteens. Who are they going to believe? Smokey the Bear, the local cop, Mommy and Daddy? They're the last person they'd believe. So who do you put up? You put up a 14-year-old talking to them in 14-year-old lingo, say, yo, bro, and he's dressed up to the hilt with all the latest colorful and really snazzy-looking, jazzy-looking stuff. And he does a triple flip when he's inline skating. And he says, yo, bro, you put on this stuff, you can do better than what I just did. In other words, they're risk takers. So you can take more risk. And that's the way I will uh, address people about who, who should be the source. Let's stop. Take some more questions. Please enter the passcode, which is claim. The first question we have is while it seems clear the warning must be worded correctly and its placement is important, but does it have to be permanently affixed? Absolutely, it has to be in a in a way that uh, the remember the, at purchase or use, uh, it is not good enough to put a warning in a place that's visible but removable or destroyed by the weather. I um, I was in a bunch of cases defending Chrysler about the. Um, uh, carburetor cleaner backfire case, carburetor backfire cases in the old days when cars actually had carburetors and uh, a lot of people would try to prime their carburetors when the car wouldn't start and they couldn't get enough gas through clogged tank to the ignition of the car and uh, Chrysler put it in the uh, in the book and they highlighted it there and that's what user manuals are for. And I had some research that people actually do among all manuals. Go to automobile manuals, which are indexed. You'll look up when you need to find something. The uh, opposite side was saying, let's put the warning <clears throat> on the air filter in the top 
And, you know, anybody who has a car, you know, it, <laughs> a little grime and grease and darkness and on and on, that would be the last place I'd put something like that. So, yeah, it's got to be in a place which, uh, at the time that injury could occur, it's still there. And uh, on the product is important. Oral warnings of construction. Every morning they have a safety briefing, five, ten minutes. Go over the key hazardous situations. It's got to be immediate and it's got to be visible. It's got to be permanent. And illegible and fade away or fall off. I, I, there's so many examples I could point out to, but trust me, it's got to be in a permanent location. Thank Next you. Question. Due time was the last question we have time for. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to Dr. Goldhaber. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must have attended for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, TATSA also offers free interactive webinars, expert written articles, and research reports on expert witnesses such as the Challenge History Report 2.0 and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially Dr. Goldhaber for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dr. Goldhaber or if you would like to speak with a TAS representative regarding the expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today.